Uh, my name is Heather Berry, and I am the SCR Division Chair this year. I want to welcome you to the first in a series on Meta Method. Um, I am going to be rather brief, but I do want to say thank you very much to Tomasz. Um, I'm sure you saw he emailed our members and he asked about their interest in different methods. And so this series will actually focus on the methods that our STR members have the most interest in. So our first is on field experiments. Um, and I do want to say thank you to Sharik and Vanessa and Marike to, uh, for all of their time and their experience. I know our members really benefit from these types of sessions. And so I'm thrilled to actually learn about different methods over the course of this series. So Tomasz is going to be the moderator today. And so I'm going to kick it off to Tomasz. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Heather. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And again, uh, thank you, Sharik, uh, Vanessa and Marika for, for joining us, uh, joining us today. Uh, so just in terms of logistics, um, so each of the presenters will have 20 up to 20 minutes uh, for their uh, respective presentations. And uh, Sharik will begin uh, with talking about the what of, uh, of field experiments. Uh, then Vanessa will talk about the how. Uh, of field experiments, and Marika will close the presentation series with the do's and don'ts of the field experiments. Now, I would like to ask you um, to keep uh, for now your questions to the chat window. I'm going to monitor the chat and I'll try to synthesize some of the questions that are recurrent or some of the comments that are recurrent. Uh, and then at the end of the presentations, we'll have, uh, we'll have at least 20 minutes for the Q&A. And I will probably take the first five minutes if there are enough questions, of course, in the chat. Uh, so I'm trying to bring up some of the key points from the chat. And then for the remaining uh, 15 minutes, we will open it up to any questions that you may have. So again, then please uh, raise your virtual hand uh, and we will uh, you'll have a comment, question, disagree, agree uh, with the speakers. Uh, really, this the idea for this uh, for this uh, series of panels is to make it a as applied as possible, uh, right? And also, also a series where you can bring as I'm all learn uh, learn from the speakers about the the hand their hands-on experience with the uh, with the method, but also bring uh, some of the concerns or some of the questions that you that you have into this panel, and we can jointly find the best uh, some of the best solution to them. So without further ado, I, I'm going to I'm going to give it uh, give uh, some I'll turn it over to Sharik. Um, Go ahead, please. All right, wonderful. Uh, thanks, Tomas. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. And um, are people able to see my screen? Yes. Awesome. All right. So um, uh, let me begin by uh, making uh, one point, which is my name is pronounced Sharik. Uh, no, uh, uh, no problem. Uh, it's been happening since kindergarten, so uh, I'm used to it now. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. And uh, I'm supposed to present the what um, part of field experiments. And I've been doing field experiments since I was a graduate student. And um, you know, at that time, at least in strategy, there weren't uh, a lot of um, uh, you know uh, people doing uh, field experiments. Um, there were some uh, field experiments that had been done, but not people who had kind of specialized in the method. Um, uh, in our field. And so a lot of it for me was just learning by doing. And so I, I wanna just use my 20 minutes to talk about um, kind of just simply what a field experiment is. And then just some of my takes about, you know, what it takes to do a, a field experiment in terms of kind of uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, how you uh, build towards it, because it isn't uh, uh, typical um, uh, as a research method yet uh, in strategy. Okay, um, so before I begin, uh, please write down this link. Um, uh, if people can see it, um, it's a bit.ly link to a newsletter that we started uh, just a few months ago uh, uh, with about, I think 250 people are on it already. Um, uh, just across the world. Actually, most of the folks that are on this uh, mailing list are uh, non-US based. And what we're trying to do is build a, a small community around uh, field experiments, share interesting, exciting work. Vanessa's work has been shared uh, on the first, uh, on the first uh, uh, newsletter. And then we also have a corresponding conference, which we've been doing online for the last few years, 
the first year we did it, it was in person. And then three weeks later, the pandemic began. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up. Um, and we run it jointly with IGL, this is the Innovation Growth Lab uh, in, in the UK. Okay, and, and here's a sign up uh, page. All right, so empirical research and strategy kind of takes three forms. And, and I think this is like the method methodological three-legged stool uh, in uh, strategy research. Uh, you have observational studies, which make up, I would say, the bulk of work in, in our field. And uh, this is often using archival data or survey data, uh, survey data less so in fact, and, and then to a certain extent, uh, ethnography and other qualitative methods. Uh, this is basically going into uh, kind of a real world context and taking data from that context, whether it's directly um, through kind of doing a survey or using kind of archival data. To a lesser extent, we have uh, some scholars doing lab experiments. And, you know, lab experiments uh, have been foundational to the field of social psychology uh, and behavioral economics. Um, and, and they uh, appear in, in many different ways in, in strategy as well, not as much, um, uh, because oftentimes strategy questions are related to firms and it's kind of hard to replicate firm level decision making in the lab. And so this is one of the reasons why lab experiments maybe don't have as much uh, uh, play in strategy as they do in management more broadly. And then finally, field experiments. And I think, you know, I, I tried to uh, count how many field experiments there were in strategy. Um, and it's a handful, maybe five to 10 maybe 25 a year, depending on how you count uh, what a field experiment is or is not, um, but it's growing. And the number of uh, job candidates that do field experiments, the number of junior faculty doing field experiments has increased. And this is partly because there's been more awareness about, uh, about the method. Um, and so I wanna just talk to you about what a field experiment is. So, um, it's an experimental study. And what makes an experimental study different from other types of studies? And, and the main difference is the researcher has the ability to manipulate or treat or vary exogenously a variable of interest in the population they are studying. Uh, this is a key distinction between a field experiment and other field studies. And in a traditional field study where you're going out and collecting survey data, the researcher isn't poking and prodding um, uh, and trying to change outcomes. Uh, they are basically just observing and that's why they're observational studies. So an experimental study, the researcher has an active role to try to change the outcomes for one subset of people, the treatment group, and another subset of people, uh, is set as a control so you can measure the effect of the manipulation or the treatment. So that's the big uh, difference. Researcher is playing an active role. And in fact, there's a long history of uh, action research in management uh, that was not experimental specifically in nature, uh, but where researchers went in and tried to see, could we make a change? Could we see how doing something differently, organizing differently, changing communication patterns would have an effect, okay. Now the difference with a field experiment and a lab experiment is it is conducted in the real world. And what does that mean? It means that the subjects of the experimental study are people going about their business in the real world doing what they do. Uh, this could be workers searching for jobs as in Vanessa's context, for instance, or in my context, entrepreneurs who want to build and grow their startups. Um, other folks have looked at firms and thinking about decision-making in terms of how do you fund R&D? So research managers can be a subject of the experiment, but the real world with real people who have jobs where real things are at stake for them uh, is the big distinction between an experiment that's done in the lab where you're getting at some basic foundational psychological process Whereas a field experiment is trying to understand the impact of a manipulation or a treatment in the real world. The third thing is um, these participants can be individuals, they can be teams, they can be firms. Um, and let me go to the last uh, kind of uh, item, which is firms. There are very few field experiments with firms. 
and understandably so. And this is because firms are really hard to get as a sample. Um, getting even startups, even a couple of hundred startups that have revenue, that have multiple employees to come in and participate in an experimental treatment is expensive. You have to incentivize them to take time out of their day to come in. Uh, and why wouldn't they want the best treatment you can offer? Why would they want to be in the control group? So convincing these participants, individuals, teams, or firms that are in the real world with real incentives to come in and uh, you know, go along with your research study is a challenge. These individuals are often embedded in a meaningful social context or an economic context. This is the other big distinction with experiments. And this makes a field experiment much more like an observational study because an observational study evaluates people people or firms and their outcomes in a competitive context, for instance, you know, and competition changes how people make decisions or uh, the capital constraints faced by companies affect how they make decisions. And we're really interested not in the impact of a decision, um, a, a treatment, independent of all these things that are moving around and that can affect how people behave, but really in the context of how people are making their decisions in the, in the real environments that they're in. Uh, and the outcomes are consequential and meaningful, um, and their incentives are consequential and meaningful. So if I think about, you know, uh, my initial studies um, uh, where these weren't in the strategy context, but they were with students, the treatment affected students' ability to uh, hopefully improve their grades, which matters for their labor market outcomes. Um, in later studies, my last field experiment, we worked with venture funded startups um, that had, you know, 10 to 12 employees were around for three years. They wanted to either have a successful exit, not die, or raise another round of funding. And these are very consequential outcomes for them. And they had incentives, which were uh, real. They, they needed to make their company succeed. Um, and this is also an important distinction. So what's the empirical challenge we are trying to solve with a field experiment? Um, you know, here's our standard regression, y, which is some outcome, beta zero plus beta one, and an explanatory variable. Any empirical researcher, regardless of what empirical research you do, you have a model like this in your mind. And the explanatory variable can be knowledge, for instance, uh, or organizational structure or the incentives that managers have to innovate, or the network ties that managers have to people outside their firm, or resources and capabilities inside the firm. And the problem is that these explanatory variables are, uh, there you go, um, biased because of selection. Firms are rational, or trying to be rational and choosing how much they invest in a resource, how much they invest in building network ties because they have some sense of how these things will impact their outcomes. What that means is when you're running that regression, the beta one is potentially biased, meaning it could be really large. And so maybe it's not the network ties that are really impacting the outcomes of the entrepreneur, but it's the fact that the entrepreneur is really good. And as a result of them being really good, they have a lot of network ties and you have omitted variable bias. So you don't, you have a lot of uncertainty about B1. You don't know whether B1 is the factor that's going to really change firm performance or entrepreneurial performance or worker outcomes. But that's, that's the really crucial worry. And, and I would say this is not a vanity kind of issue. It's not like a issue that researchers only care about it's an issue that managers care about because managers want to know if I do something, will it matter? Will it have an effect? Um, and that's consequential. Firms want to know if I change my investments to invest in going out and building these resources and capabilities, will it affect my bottom line? Like they don't want to know a correlation. They want to know the cause. And that's why field experiments actually tie into managerial uh, incentives just much more tightly. Um, and so the big question that field experiments uh, kind of help you answer is, does the explanatory variable really lead to why? Um, and uh, th this, is, this is what makes field experiments kind of more consequential. 
Traditionally, what we've done is we've used control variables. We use fixed effects. We've used matching to get to this all else equal condition. But the problem with the all else equal condition with these other approaches is uh, there, there's, a, there's a challenge. Um, in an experiment, um, uh, you as a researcher are going in and exogenously assigning access to this explanatory variable for some and not others. In the observational context, there's always a doubt uh, as to whether all else is really equal. Uh, and this is a, a, an important constraint because for instance, um, when you include a control variable, you have only observables, but it's hard to uh, observe other things like how much knowledge uh, does an entrepreneur really have? What are their incentives? What are uh, they, their beliefs about the distribution of outcomes? Those can't be controlled for because they're just so hard to measure. Control variables allow you to deal with the all else equal condition only on observables. What randomization does is it randomizes the allocation of the explanatory variable. You flip a coin and that coin flip is completely uncorrelated. Uh, uh, so you have a coin, I have a coin so here. Actually, surprisingly, there is a coin on the floor of my office, the penny uh, right here. And I flip this coin and I'm going down my list. It, Tomas, are you treatment or control? Has treatment? Okay, your control. Um, Heather, you know, are you treatment or control? Okay, your control. I'm, I'm not good at flipping coins. There we go. Uh, Marike, okay, your, your, con, uh, your treatment, okay? Uh, completely uncorrelated to who you are is just a flip of the coin. That is really, really powerful. The reason it's really powerful is I can get balance that if I do this long enough with large numbers of people, the characteristics of my treatment group, both on the things that I observe and on the things that I don't observe, the things that are really, really hard to observe, like how they're feeling today um, or whether they woke up with a headache or whether they had a great elementary school teacher that changed their you know, perspective of business, completely equal in expectation on both the treatment and control. And so I know that my explanatory variable, if there's a correlation between that and the outcome variable, I can just attribute it to my explanatory variable because everything else is equal, okay? Um, so randomization removes some selection. And let me say the sum part, which is I can give you a treatment, which is I'm gonna give you a lecture about how um, using your network is a great idea to help your business grow. But you could be snoozing and um, uh, during my you know, treatment condition. And what that means is um, you may actually not pay attention to the treatment uh, at all. And so you may not get the treatment. So there is selection and your uh, propensity to snooze is correlated to these other characteristics. Did you have a bad day today or whatever? But that should be uncorrelated on both sides of the uh, treatment and control. The only challenge is if the treatment is substantially better or worse than the control and people recognize this, they may select out, uh, right? And so uh, think about when you learn that, hey, I'm not getting the real vaccine, I'm getting a placebo. I wanna go and get the real vaccine. Uh, that breaks the experiment down. And as a consequence, there are approaches to deal with this type of selection, which is selection after the treatment has been assigned. I won't get into that. That's a little bit more nuanced, um, but that's, one area where selection issues aren't resolved because of an experiment. And in expectation, the ex uh, uh, explanatory variable is now uncorrelated, both the observed and unobserved characteristic of the treatment unit. So here's the difference between lab experiments. Lab experiments are great, but lack. Longer time horizons, real incentives, meaningful dependent variables, profits, outcomes in a, versus outcomes in a game. The field part of a field experiment provides the benefits of experiments in real life settings with real people doing real things. And I think this is a, a perfect match for strategy because strategy is really about understanding what firms can do to create a competitive position in a real marketplace, not necessarily people in a lab. And so I think the exciting, fun stuff about doing field experiments and strategy is really thinking about what are the factors, what are the things that we researchers believe theoretically are gonna move the needle for firms, move the needle for workers in terms of, uh, for instance, um, you know, getting ahead uh, in terms of innovation or hiring the best workers uh, and so on.
As a result, um, what field experiments give us is the ability to concretely demonstrate the impact of an explanatory variable on meaningful outcomes, that's the treatment effect, show how these outcomes vary by treated units. These are heterogeneous treatment effects, so how much does the treatment uh, affect Tomas versus Marike differentially? This is huge for strategy, right? I mean, strategy is all about firms doing different things um, and the fact that, uh, you know, uh, different resources and different capabilities and different knowledge plug in in different ways to existing firm characteristics. Uh, how this treatment effect, whether it's uh, kind of the base treatment effect or the heterogeneous treatment effect, affects performance in the long term, like long term outcomes is what we care about. Um, and all of these. Uh, insights from the uh, analysis of an experiment can serve as a basis for action uh, by managers, policy by governments, or advice we give in the MBA classroom. I'll, I'll stop there, um, use my 20 minutes. Right, thank you so much, Tarek. It's, uh, it's great, uh, really appreciate it. And so now that we know the what, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, go to the how, and I think Vanessa, you're going to share with us two examples of then how do we get to the to actually implementing and conducting the field experiment great so i am going to attempt to share my screen now can everyone see that presentation yes okay, excellent um so yes yeah, so just to describe the how what i thought i would do is give a couple of examples um one just sort of a, a process how example of a, a field experimented implemented within a real company um, and then an example of sort of a process of a uh, field experiment implemented on an online labor market platform. And then after that, I'll say a little bit about sort of the types of questions that these online labor market platforms work well for in terms of sort of implementing these types of field experiments. So the field experiment implemented within a company. Um, this is a working paper that I'm working on with Florencio Porto Carrero. He is a PhD student at UC Irvine. Um, and as I will describe in this process, it, it's really his contacts with this bank that allowed us um, to implement this field experiment. And then in terms of the field experiment implemented in online labor market platform, I'm gonna describe a little bit the sort of process that I went through um, for this management science paper that was just uh, published. Um, I won't go into sort of too much detail on sort of the theory or the results or any of that stuff. I'm going to try to dive into the process side of things, um, and you can certainly read the paper for sort of more detail on sort of exactly what was done. So in terms of this uh, first field experiment, so this is a field experiment that's done in collaboration with a large bank in Latin America. And at a high level, what we are interested in, in sort of researching is understanding how sort of a one-time volunteering activity sort of a single one-time event in which employees engage in a social cause, like a community service activity or uh, environmental activity or something like that, that is implemented as part of an onboarding process for employees, whether this affects employee outcomes in any way. So this is something that's sort of becoming more common, um, but we know very little about whether sort of including this as part of the onboarding pra pra practice actually influences employees in any way. And so what we wanted to randomly assign is this volunteering activity across new employees, um, which is usually tricky because you know if, if you look at sort of observational data, anytime employees self-select to volunteer in one of these typical types of activities, you know you, you're essentially you're, you're incorporating the selection piece that sort of Sharik was describing is sort of one of the main elements we're trying to get rid of when we sort of implement a field experiment. So what we wanted to essentially do is randomly assign whether or not these new employees took place, you know, essentially did this activity with, uh, with community, did a community service activity organized by the firm or not. And then what we wanted to measure out afterwards was basically really as much employee data as the firm would allow us to access. So we wanted to sort of, you know, we wanted to track turnover, we wanted to track any performance outcomes that we could get from the employees. Um, we wanted to implement a survey if they would allow us to, to try to get at some sort of the, the things like the stress that they're experienced at, the, at work, perceptions of the company and things like that. Um, but in designing this, we were sort of, basically our outcome variable that we had in mind was sort of whatever employee variables the, the firm will allow us to capture. 
So in terms of the process, so the conversations with the bank began back in 2016. Um, Florencio had a uh, close contact at the bank that ended up being um, the, the, that we ended up collaborating with. Uh, there was a, a whole lot of time that we spent presenting to meeting with various individuals in this bank, um, the head of CSR, the entire CSR team, then the head of HR, then um, the entire HR team, then the employee experience manager. Sort of, we sort of were, were slowly making our way through, I guess, the list of individuals um, who had to kind of agree to this project to be able to implement it within the firm. Um, and so in a lot of ways, this was sort of the most kind of time consuming and stressful and uncertain part of the process because it was a lot of time expended. Um, Florencio actually went in person to uh, do a number of these. I, I didn't go in person, but I, I sort of uh, joined virtually um, and certainly on, on his behalf and, and mine as well. It was it was quite it's quite a time investment. So this, I think, is the part of the process we were, where we were sort of, you know, the, the cost benefit trade off for a researcher is maybe the most uncertain. Um, after we got the buy-in from the key members of the organization, we then worked on the essentially the design of the study um, because it was going to be implemented by the firm. You know, we had to, it, there was a lot of work just in terms of sort of making sure that the study would be implemented um, in the way that we would want it to. So, for example, like really being clear about what a random assignment would mean in this context, and so we offered to do the random assignment for them and things like that. Um, where we're just sort of making sure that, you know, the, 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 the implementers aren't researchers. And so there's this element of kind of connection between the researcher and the implementing team um, where you're trying to just sort of make sure that everything is, is, is going to be implemented in the way um, that will allow you to tell this causal story. Uh, we pilot tested just the treatment, so this volunteering activity essentially on some existing employees um, who, who've done corporate volunteering in the past, basically just to make sure that everything was sort of set up in terms of who the uh, nonprofit organ organization was that was going to be the recipient of these, these types of volunteering activities for the actual study that would be implemented later. So there was also sort of an element of, um, again, this is just trying to make sure that the, that the organization was sort of ready and had all the all their T's crossed for the implementation of the, of the actual study. The actual intervention took place in, 2000, in, in 2018. Uh, we collected data on these employees for the next uh, year. We then, after collecting all of the data, had did, did a number of sort of presentations to and meetings with the bank representatives. So back in the early phases where we were trying to sell the study to them, one of the things that we offered them um, was essentially that we would sort of, you know, be doing this causal st study and then that we would then sort of present on their behalf to other parts of the bank. So part of the selling point was, you know, we're going to help you be able to sort of tell a causal story about the impact of these types of um, activities on things like employee turnover or more motivation or other employee outcomes. And then we will help you sort of disseminate those within your organization. And so that was kind of part of the part of the process and getting them on board at the very beginning. And so we had you know, some work at the end where we were then complying with what we had agreed to do uh, with the bank. And so now this year we are finalizing the paper, sort of writing up the results and, um, and, and, and hope to submit it soon. And then I'll just say a little bit more about sort of what this intervention sort of, ha you know, what, what the in intervention comprised of and some things that kind of came up um, as a result that might apply to others who are also doing these types of experiments. So in, you know, the randomization process, essentially our sample was all new employees who entered this Latin American bank in certain geographical areas during a certain time frame. And then they, these individuals we randomly assigned to either a treatment group or a control group. Um, in, in, in figuring out the ends, we had to make some assumptions about how many were likely to sort of actually comply with the treatment versus uh, choose not to do the, that day of onboarding. Um, so we had a larger intent to treat group than control group, which is quite common, I think, in these types of designs when you are assuming that not everyone in your kind of intent to treat group will be treated. Uh, the, in, the actual intervention, as you can see, you know, there were about 91 employees who received the treatment, uh, 67 who did not participate, who were in the intent to treat group, um, and then 63 who were in assigned to the control group. 
And then we implemented a survey a couple of weeks after the, uh, the intervention to get at some self-reported outcomes, like perceptions of the employer, perceptions of the employer's social responsibility, work stress, organizational identification, and some other outcomes. Um, and then one of the main things we were really interested in looking at was turnover data. So we, we tracked them for a year after uh, this intervention, and we interestingly found that those who were randomly assigned to the treatment group were less likely to leave the firm a year later, which is, which is a pretty substantial outcome from sort of an, a strategic human capital um, perspective. So some best practices, I guess, and learnings from this experiment uh, and, and others similar to this that, that, I, that I've engaged in. So pre-registration forms, I think, are fantastic in that they can help you clarify many aspects of your experimental design. So I really like actually writing them out even well before you're actually going to pre-register your study, because I find it just really brings kind of clarity to the process and the, the implementation design that you have in mind. Um, you know, think about alternate explanations or issues that reviewers are likely to come up with before you run the study, because as you can see from that timeline, you know, it's a very time consuming process and you just don't, it, it's really hard to sort of amend data the way you do with, with archival data, for example, for these types of studies. So really putting the time up front and sort of thinking of these things ahead of time um, saves a lot of trouble, I think, down the pipeline. It's helpful to be very clear with the collaborating organization, like what exactly you are asking of them, what exactly are they doing versus are you doing, um, what exactly are is the format of sort of the data you want to gather after afterwards. So we had a lot of discussions, for example, to about ensuring that the uh, you know that that the data would at the end of the day be unidentifiable. So we wanted to match the employees to all of this data, but at the same time ensure that you know that data wasn't sort of um, going against their privacy um, or any any of these types of issues. And so that took a lot of just kind of speaking with with the collaborating organization. Um, one thing I highly recommend is to be clear with them before you run the study that you intend to publish your results regardless of whether or not they like the effects that you find. Um, this can sometimes be a challenge. And I think one way that to sort of make co companies more comfortable with this is to ensure them that you, they're not going to be named in the paper. So, you know, I just talk about them as a large Latin American bank. There's a whole lot of large Latin American banks that this could apply to. And so I'm not sort of um, naming them in any way uh, but it, I think it's really important because of how time consuming these are to make sure that they are on board with the idea that you intend to publish your results, you know, regardless of whether or not you actually get the effects that they are hoping that you will get and sometimes you don't. I have found um, leveraging personal connections for these types of things really does help. As I mentioned, you know, Florencio is really the reason that we were able to implement the study because of his connection with this bank. Um, and so does any, I think, kind of unique value add that you maybe bring to the table as a researcher. So one thing I think that really helped us as this co-author team um, is that we both speak Spanish fluently. So, you know, we're engaging with a Latin American bank. They don't have a ton of researchers from top universities who happen to speak Spanish, who want to sort of work with them on these types of things. So I consider this maybe, you know, kind of a unique value add that we were able to bring to this, to this relationship that kind of helped us to, to get them on board. So that's kind of an example of a um, you know, field experiment in implemented within a company. Um, I also have done quite a bit of field experiments implemented on, on different types of online labor market platforms. So I thought I'd just walk you through this kind of how process for, for this one paper um, and then give some sort of tips on the types of things that I think work well in these types of marketplaces. So for this particular paper, I was interested in understanding how an employer communicating a stance on a social political issue would affect employee behavior. So what I wanted to randomly assign is an employer's stance on a social political issue. And so you can imagine how actually do, doing that in a, in a real firm would be very challenging. It's really hard to sort of randomly assign a firm's stance on gun control or climate change or, or something like that. And then what I wanted to measure afterwards were all just measure, measures of employee motivation, willingness to do extra work, work quality, et cetera. 
So the process that I went through for this experiment, so I, in 2017, I designed and ran two experiments, one on Upwork and one on Amazon Mechanical Turk, where I essentially hired workers to do real jobs for payment, randomly assigned um, a fictitious company's uh, social political stance about climate change, and then observed the effect on their actual work uh, productivity. Um, some sort of process things that I've discovered that I thought might be helpful for others to realize. So one is that, you know, the IRB process is very time consuming for these types of studies because you are usually asking for a lack of informed consent from study participants and these studies involve some sort of deception. And so essentially it's on the onus of the researcher to sort of convince the IRB that the benefits of what we're gaining from the knowledge that will, will result as a result of the study, you know, is, is um, outweighs any concerns that we might have about uh, lack of informed consent, et cetera. So the, before you can run these experiments, you know, this IRB process can be time consuming and it is sort of a big part of the investment, I think, in sort of them being able to do this type of study. Um, one other thing that I discovered is, you know, after running these experiments, the results were not what I pre-registered that I was expecting. I expected to find sort of that if employees agreed with the stance of the company, they would work harder. And if they disagreed with the stance of the company, they would work less hard. That's what I pre-registered. I only found that if they disagreed with the company, they worked less hard. So I, I had some sort of angst going on as I'm trying to write up this paper in terms of like, well, I pre-registered this expectation. It's not what I found. So how do I deal with that in, in writing up this paper? Um, so I sim submitted the paper to Management Science. I got a reject and resubmit um, determination. I added a third study, which I was using to try to address some of the issues in the reject and resubmit. Um, I then got a major revision determination. And when I got this major revision determination, I just didn't think the, the issues that they had um, they were valid concerns and my existing studies, I just couldn't figure out how to address the reviewer concerns within the confines of the existing studies. Um, and so for this one, I ended up actually designing and implementing a completely new, what I call two phase experiment, and I'll describe that in very high level terms for implementation on Upwork. Um, and then all of my other studies are now on an online appendix that's referenced uh, in this paper. But so one thing that's a little bit different, I think, for this type of study compared to like the field experiment that I described earlier, like there's no way we could rerun a study with um, the Latin American <laughs> bank in sort of a, a, an R&R timeframe. Um, but with this type of study, given the concerns that I got from the review team, I, I felt that basically addressing, doing a kind of larger um, one, two-phase study that addressed everything that they could possibly bring up um, was sort of a possibility. And that's what I ended up doing with this, uh, with this paper. So the, just to give you an uh, overview of what I mean by this two-phase two field, field experimental design. So I hired workers um, to complete what I'll just call job one on Upwork. It was a translation job. I asked them to then complete a survey about their opinions about Upwork as well as other issues, including their opinions on a whole host of social political issues. You can see that I look, I'm, I'm like losing, I'm losing sample size with each stage just to give you sort of a, a sense of sort of what happens here. I then contact the same sense of set of workers by a different employer. I collaborated with a real startup for the second phase of the study uh, to complete what I call job two. And here's when I randomly assigned the employer stance conditions on a, uh, um, previously stratified by the previously disclosed opinions from the survey either. So essentially some of the critiques that I had gotten in this review process was that what I had done is, 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 is conducted the manipulations and then surveyed the employees after the fact. And some of the critiques that I got was that, well, some of the things you're asking them afterwards are going to be influenced by the treatment condition. And so this kind of two-phase design sort of flips that on its head um, and then assures that that won't be biasing results. However, you know, the, the downside of it, um, to, again, to, I'm trying to give sort of the good and bad of, of this process is, as you can see, the sample size I started with at the end of the day, it's only 782 that have sort of the data that I can use for the study. And so as part of this process, I discovered that I actually had to amend my pre-registration for this new study because in the middle of the study so i had phase one and phase two during phase one i realized that my anticipated sample size was not going to be enough because of the number of people who were dropping off before i could get them to the second phase 
So I had to go through the process of actually amending my pre-registration. Luckily, I didn't actually start phase two yet, which is when the random assignment of conditions take place. So it shouldn't have affected results. But this was also kind of an, an anxious process for me as the researcher in this in this sort of um, process in terms of sort of realizing, okay, I'm going to have to amend the, amend the pre-registration. And then I just tried to be very transparent in the paper write-up um about you know this is what i pre-registered this is what i found this is what I, why i had to sort of amend the pre-registration just try to sort of be very transparent about about the process because as you can see from what i just described um some things that i hadn't expected kind of came up here so i thought i would just say um a, a few things quickly about you know the types of questions that i think work well with these types of settings so Settings like Upwork, Elance, Odesk, um, MTurk, and I, I cite a few papers that I, I have used this type of thing, and you can kind of read them for a little bit more detail on the process. But I think as a high level, they're really exciting for research questions when the dependent variable of interest that you are looking at is an on-the-job worker outcome, like wages accepted, job performance, misconduct on the job, et cetera. What you can do is randomly assign an employer or company level characteristic, which is, you know, I have looked at things related to social political stances and social responsibility because of my research interest. But there's a whole host of types of things that I think, based on your research interest, that you might imagine could be randomly assigned here. And then for moderators or mediators, uh, the platform will often have a lot of worker characteristics that you can use that might be theoretically interesting for your question. Uh, for online employment search engines uh, like Career Builder, ZipRecruiter, Indeed, Monster, I think this is very useful for research questions when the dependent variable of interest is something like the characteristics of who's going to apply to a given job or the amount of applicant interest in a job. Again, you can sort of randomly assign any employer or company characteristic and then job seeker characteristics often generated by like their resumes or something like that um, can be interesting moderators or mediators. And then, you know, so I have, I kind of turned to these online labor mar market platforms as a PhD student initially out of an interest of wanting to do field experiments and kind of a frustration in my personal experience of the field experiments with established companies in terms of how long it was taking and, and whether or not I could sort of actually have the control and randomly assign what I wanted to do. So I sort of turned to this as uh, what I felt at the time was kind of a necessity. Um, now I've, I've sort of done a number of these, I find them very exciting. And one of the things that I will say is that I think, you know, I've used labor related thing platforms because of my interests and, and research focus. But I actually think that, you know, online two sided platform markets more broadly, because there's more of them beyond just labor related ones, I think are really potentially interesting settings for RCTs and strategy. And the idea is that you can kind of randomly assign the characteristics of one side and observe how the other side responds. These platforms often involve communication portals. So there's the potential for sort of textual analysis and things like that there. I haven't done that yet, but that's something that I'm thinking of doing um, in some future studies. And, you know, platform markets are just becoming important for the economy. And so I think there's even just a theoretical interest now in understanding how behavior of the one side influences um, behavior on the other side. So some best practices for these online platforms specifically, I highly recommend, you know, test out what the process is like for each side of the platform before running the experiment. Um, keep in mind that they change very frequently. So don't submit your pre-registration until right before you're ready to implement, because sometimes they will change like a key aspect of the platform. If you if your main variable was like a rating system, uh, a rating, for example, that that's provided on an on an employee, and then they change the platform such that you no longer have a five star rating, you now have like qualitative comments or something like that. Um, your whole study pre-registration doesn't apply. So I've learned to sort of wait until the very last minute to submit the pre-registration form um, and gather the information sort of as you go. Don't wait until the very end, because again, if the platform sort of changes something um, that was kind of key, a key variable for you in the middle of the implementation, you're kind of left, uh, left without. And then of course, you know, I think getting IRB approval and just taking into account any ethical considerations in, in the design is obviously very important. Okay, that's all that I have for you on the how. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Marika. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, some more sharing the, your experiences, both with uh, some more running field experiments in the, the established companies and 
and uh, somehow in the online labor market context, I think it was very clear about the, in a sense, the the, the cost, uh, the the cost, the balance of costs, potentially of the benefits. And I think that's something that is that is a recurring uh, question that we'll turn to probably first after after Marika's presentation is is somehow this link between uh, somehow field experiments with established companies field experiments in online context versus lab experiments. And, and in a sense, I, I, I think there's some potential disagreement also among the, among the speakers. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that discussion, but now I'll turn, over, um, uh, turn it over to Marika. You're muted, Marika. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So awesome. So I think there's already quite a lot that um, Vanessa and Sharika touched upon. So I'll, I'll try to be brief and I try to summarize some, some do's and, and believe me, lots of don'ts from our own experience as well. Um, so, so here we go. There's five of them. Um, so one, and this really uh, connects with the timelines that Vanessa was doing. Um, but I actually, I would really say that uh, when you are uh, entering a discussion with your potential um, partner, please you know take your time and don't don't rush. In my experience, finding that sweet spot uh, of where um, you know trying to understand the context, the field, uh, what the problem of your partner organization may be, or what is a priority, what is of interest to them, um, what are some of the constraints they have, uh, what strikes you as really interesting. And then going back to the to, to your you know uh, to the research um, diagnosing that problem from your own um, perspective from your own uh, using your own research um, lenses um, is a is a is a really exciting and I I I would concur with that as it can be quite stressful because you're like oh you're trying to find something and and it's not always uh, that easy but that iterative process is a uh, is a really important one to then uh, hopefully. Uh, find that sweet spot, uh, find a good fit between uh, what you would like to understand and uh, what the field allows you to understand. I think there's another additional benefit from taking your time in that early phase is that you build the trust, uh, showing to your partner organization that you really care about understanding their context, builds trust, it builds goodwill, um, secure buy-in because as uh, also Vanessa was saying, along the road, you don't want them to all of a sudden change their practices completely because that may mess up really your ability to, to, to detect the cause and impact of your treatment. So you need quite a lot of buy-in to implement, potentially implement the treatment um, the way you would like it to be uh, in a very uh, consistent manner. And then also not to do many other things uh, at the same time because that could potentially really mess up uh, your ability to identify cause and impact. So that, um, my experience is the time spent up front uh, allows you to identify a cool reset question, but also to, to create that goodwill which you will uh, need subsequ subsequently. Um, so just to, uh, an example of uh, the, the way this has been going for Tomás and I trying to understand the social housing context. Uh, here again, notice that exploratory phase was about 10 months, um, trying to understand what's the problem. So this is a, us being interested in social housing uh, in, in France, and we are working together with a, a social housing agency in, in, in the first commune of, uh, in France, trying to understand the problem of rent arrears and eviction. Now, it took us a while to really understand the problem. But it turns out that in this context, you know, most of the people uh, encounter a problem of rent arrears. So it seems almost like a norm to pay late at some point, which you know was not exactly what we had expected. Um, so understanding the phenomenon, what is the phenomenon really? Uh, to, it was uh, took some time. Um, subsequently. Um, you know, as we are interested, we were clearly interested in understanding how the agency interacts with its tenants. So it took us time to sort of understand what are the protocols for, you know, we met up with a number of staff members that told us what they do at what point and stage and trying to understand um, that relationship and then pick up on something that really caught our interest, which is that it seemed like this relationship uh, oscillates between something very formal, contractual, business-like, to something very informal, beneficiary-centric when the tenant has a financial problem, meaning when it has a, uh, a rent arrear. So as soon as the, the beneficiary has solved or the tenant has solved its, um, its rent arrear, the relationship uh, flips back into a very formal, business-like relationship. So that, in a nutshell, is something that 
hotter uh, interest, and we're now trying to sort of um, understand more using the experiment. So again, it took us time to understand the communication protocols. How do you know, what are the different vectors that the um, organization uses to interact with its uh, with the tenants? And then uh, very important understanding the validation process. So what is it? What do we need? <laughs> Who needs to say yes on this? Um, and then I think also commenting uh, on Heather's comment, I think often the memorandum of understanding is a really good idea where you really have a clear uh, understanding of what the expectations are from both sides uh, uh, going forward. So we are still in the exploratory phase. At this point, you've spent 10 months a little bit anxious about where this is going, but I, I try to stay optimist and think that all of this is going to have some positive um, benefit on the subsequent phases because the goodwill can actually speed up uh, the agreement over the intervention itself. Um, and then again, um, we have uh, quite a few months ahead of us. So, um, so all, you know, all in all, the 10 months of exploring uh, is probably um, is, is, is going to be outweighed by all the, all the good stuff that is uh, yet to come in, in this example. Um, OK, so then another example of a study where I wish I had done more of this. So this is a study that's I'm going to be uh, traditionally accepted at SMJ with Rodolphe, also in the same commune, so the first uh, you know, commune in France, where um, we were interested in how corporate social initiatives uh, try, can better engage with their target beneficiaries, uh, who in this example are really low-income families with, with a zero to three-year-old baby. Now, so, so we ran the experiment, uh, we find a result, so you know, it was an experiment why we, where why we encouraged, so it's really an encouragement design where we encouraged uh, the households to sign up and roll onto the program um, using different um, messages. Uh, all in all, you know, 1,200 people signed up following the experiment, so it was, I would say, a success. But what we didn't anticipate was that there were 700 more that also uh, signed up to the program, but who never received the mailing. So what this suggests is that there was a very strong spillover effect. So people were forwarding this message to their friends or uh, people in their networks who, 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 who they thought could be interested in enrolling onto the program as well. So had we had, had I think this is something, had we had spoken more with target beneficiaries, maybe this would have come out of our discussions trying to understand the fusion of information. And um, if we, you know, then we would have been better equipped to potentially capture that um, um, a part of the impact that the treatment has had or the experiment has had, um, here we were just too late. And uh, once the intervention is in the field, it was really hard, you know, it wasn't possible to, 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 to change the protocol in terms of data collection to, to get at this. Okay. All right. So we move on to, so well, the other thing I actually think in this again, and uh, Vanessa, you brought this up, like I, I, I would say pre-register, don't wait. So uh, be very uh, transparent. I also believe that Filling in these pre-registration forms before filling the intervention is a good uh, check to see uh, whether you have enough clarity over what are the primary outcomes you're trying to affect. You are very clear about the design, uh, the randomization methods, randomization unit, clustering, sample size. At this stage, you should also be doing, um, you know, um, checking whether you have enough power uh, for, for running the, the experiment. We'll come to the power issue in a minute, but just to, so to say that these these fields are. are are quite useful to, to fill in. They are time stamped, but as Vanessa showed in her example, you can also upload modifications. And so um, it's really a concise record of original intentions, um, not really not a binding contract for what the final analysis will be. Well, let me give you an example. So I have this, a paper uh, in RNR um, where uh, we, we registered uh, and we also uploaded a pre analysis plan. Now, pre-analysis plan is actually more detailed than, than simply registering, registering your experiment. In the pre-analysis plan, you actually specify which are the different regressions you're going to run. So it's quite, a, um, quite, uh, quite extensive, a little bit more expense, extensive. Now, here's wh wh why I want to say this is also a don't, but I regret now because our referee is, is holding us, you know, asking us, why did you deviate from the pre-analysis plan? Um, and I think when you fill in a pre-analysis plan, I don't think our reviewers have a still, a, there's not a, yet a code of contact of a conduct of how you use, how you, um, how you use the pre-analysis plan when reviewing a, a piece of research. My, my sense would be that I would suggest you try to be very explicit about uh, stuff you are inserted about, uh, because um, otherwise you may have reviewers that after that really hold you like, why did you not implement exactly what you learned? Had in mind, well, 
I also, and especially in the context of this piece of research in Congo, there were so many parameters we were uncertain about. It would have helped in hindsight to make that more explicit in our pre-analysis plan. Um, uh, well, you know, and sometimes also pre-registration is not possible because actually this is a piece of work with uh, Caroline Flammer, Anise Fangwa, and Bertrand Kela, where we had a hunt of luck, to, so to speak, that we've come, we've been invited to do a piece of research on an experiment that was already in the field. So, uh, but that should not stop us from doing this piece of research, right? So we should be not, not too uh, categorical about, oh, we, I think the idea is, would be, if you can do pre-register pre before um, uh, undertaking your field experiment, but uh, sometimes you, you have a piece of luck where you're able to study something that was actually well implemented in, in using a, uh, an experimental design. Um, okay, so then third, uh, third element, uh, determine your power. And so don't be underpowered. So this is a real disaster. And this is a true challenge with uh, field uh, experiments is that you have gone all the way after all this hard work. And then all of a sudden, you know, through, I mean, Vanessa, you were getting, you were showing us the numbers were shrinking. At some point, there's a real challenge that, oh my God, you don't have enough power any longer to identify any meaningful effects. And that, that is, um, that is uh, yeah, that is kind of a pity and that happens. Um, so obviously, so that what that suggests is that please uh, do these power calculations before running your experiment. When you register, you're actually asked to do this. So, so that would be um, a good practice. And, you know, in these, when you do these um, power calculations, there's a number of parameters you set. I mean, this one, desired power is, is, a, is a kind of rule of thumb. So there's not much discretion here. Typically, you know, we, we work with a 20 or 10% uh, risk of having a, a type two error, running a type two error, meaning that actually you, your experiment had an effect, but your sample size is not, you, you know, you're not able to detect that uh, significant effect. But, you know, we typically don't want this uh, chance of uh, having a, mm, running into a type two error to be uh, bigger than 20, 20%. Then another key element that you need to actually introduce in these calculations is what's the uh, effect size? What, do you, what kind of effect do you uh, expect to have? When you're doing new stuff, this is really hard to say. Uh, well, when this treatment has never been tested, how do you? What what can you say in terms of the the, the effect size, the expected effect size? Um, what 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 we typically do here is to really ask your partner of what is the kind of meaningful effect size. What would what do you expect? I mean, maybe Vanessa, you had this discussion with your partner where you know what kind of impact do you expect from a kind of one-off voluntary experience. What what kind of what's the size of the impact that you you're, that is reasonable that would actually justify running this experiment? So that will be these these are the parameters you you plug into these calculations and these calculations you can run them on and Stata or any other this various number of software programs you can use for this. Now one uh, serious uh, distinction from um, perhaps online experiments is that in the field uh, often. The sample size is a hard constraint. Um, you know, your organization only has so many employees, or uh, only uh, has served so many customers, or only has uh, um, that, that kind of uh, limitation. Uh, is a, it can be a hard constraint. So, so does that mean you need to give up? Well, no. Actually, there's you know there's a couple of things that you can still do. I mean, you, maybe it's worth running your experiment still, but limiting your treatment arms to avoid running this risk of ha having run an underpowered uh, experiment. The other thing that we do. Uh, we can, uh, we do have control over is really the strength of your manipulation. So there's a, a couple of things you can do to make sure that whatever you're trying to manipulate um, is powerful enough. Um, so you can, you can think about re re repetition um, or um, using, if this is, these are experiments embedded in text, uh, you can think about adding visuals or something to, to uh, augment the, the, the strength, the, the effect size that you could expect to have. Um, so those are the, the two levers you have when you're faced with a, uh, a constraint in terms of sample size, um, which by the way, can also be due to a budget constraint. Okay, so this is just, uh, I'm gonna go briefly, but here you see two treatments. These are treatments about embedded in, in text, but you see here, we tried to pull out all the levers we have. So this is again, the project of its social housing where we use, we change the content of the message uh, just uh, um, in a very balanced way. Um, we change the heading, we change the, 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 the visuals. So there's a lot of tools and tricks we, we used to um, in, in, in ensure that the strength of exper experiment will be, will be uh, big enough. 
Um, then there's also a bunch of tests you, you should do when you, when you consider these kinds of uh, experiments is uh, using Spacey or other uh, linguistic software to actually ensure that actually you're not introducing any different any other differences between the two treatments except what you actually want to uh, vary what you actually consider as your main um, main distinction between your treatment and control. Okay, um, just to a, a few two more two more to go. Uh, follow up over time, so don't let go. I think this goes, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that attrition is like a, is a real challenge sometimes, uh, especially when you're running an experiment over a, a number of years, losing subjects that were treated, not being able to follow them up in terms of their behavior or if you're doing running surveys can also be a, a real disaster in terms of power. Uh, but also attrition obviously brings, raises another concern is that you're Nutrition can be biased, and so that may actually affect uh, your ability to, to draw any meaningful conclusions from, from, from the data you have. So I guess the motto here is just uh, do everything you can to avoid attrition. Um, yeah, really do everything you can do. Um, and so, so I think there's a couple of smart ways uh, to, to try to do this as well, is to try to leverage existing tracking uh, in data infrastructure. So um, one thing is that you can, you can run your own survey data, but you know, if there's, for instance, already a, a systematic uh, survey that the company already runs or your partner organization already runs, you can surf on that and, and potentially that will um, that may um, have a good uh, a good response rate and so may may allow you to limit the problem of um, of attrition. Um, and again, I think more and more our the field is becoming setting the bar higher and higher. We like to see immediate impact, but often we also want to see. Um, impact over time, so the short, medium, and long term. So you should anticipate what what are the what are you how are you going to track that data, and again, what what are what are the tools you can use to uh, try to limit um, the risk of uh, attrition. Um, here is, is an experiment uh, we ran in, in UK um, on on a set of uh, early nascent entrepreneurs. But again, uh, here we used really the we surfed on the existing data infrastructure that the company or this organization had uh, to follow up on our on our individuals that were treated, uh, and then we also used other official registries to see essentially what what happened to these guys. Did they actually start up their enterprise? What kind of enterprise did they start up? And this treatment was really uh, about um, mentoring and, and um, training about uh, how to start up your own uh, social enterprise. Okay. Last point, because I don't want to uh, allow for questions. So the last thing I, and this again resonates with Vanessa, really take the time to give back. So give back in terms of your partner, you're often asking quite a lot from your partner. So make sure they get enough out of it. Um, um, <clears throat> and I think, so So here's one one funny, one example of, of the project that we ran with Rodolphe, where actually we, we generated evidence for this, this organization. Uh, subsequently, they were um, invited to become uh, part of um, our president's uh, strategy to fight child poverty, and now they're going to roll out nationwide. So clearly, this is all causal. This is all thanks to us. <laughs> Kidding, of course. But 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 there is you know there is a, a real sense that with this kind of research, you can you can uh, generate data that can be incredibly powerful for your partner to uh, communicate about. Um, um, and, and use also as a, as a piece of evidence that they, they know what they're doing. Um, so this is kind of, uh, and the other thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that when you, given um, how much your time you spend um, on building that relationship, in my experiences, my experience, um, and of course I, I hear I highlight the, the positive experiences, um, but when this relationship works well, um, chances are that there will be future opportunities to work together again. So, so um, I, um, yeah, in the case of this, this particular experiment that we, we're now finally publishing soon, uh, there's other projects um, that are underway um, that I think couldn't have, we couldn't have imagined it had we not started there. So this kind of building on these relationships in the long run makes a lot of sense. And so how, you, how do you give back? Well, you give back through data and, and, and delivering useful results, media attention, uh, presenting to the staff, key stakeholders, and what we do here, you know, what I try to do as well is bring them to the students. Uh, they like to, you know, so it's kind of real case. Our students, uh, it gives them exposure to our students who they potentially want to recruit or, or you know, there's kind of win-win opportunities. Um, but I think that relationship giving back is, is, is tremendous. I think it's our duty to do so, but, but more egoistically so, 
it can sometimes also generate new opportunities. Okay, so here we go. This is the um, list of what I think are some of the do's and don'ts. Um, so take your time, don't rush, pre-register, don't hide. Uh, I mean, don't hide what you want to do and your intentions. Determine your power and don't be underpowered. Um, follow up over time, don't let go, don't let go of your subjects. Um, and then of course, um, give back and don't give up. So that's, that's it for me. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Marika, and uh, thank you all again. Um, so now we we do have some time uh, uh, for for discussion. So again, there weren't too many questions uh, in the in the chat either because you you held back the the the, the most important questions or because everything was super clear. Um, there was a recurring discussion that I think that we we could maybe start with, and this was discussion of somehow of the extent to which lab experiments are a, and field experiments are substitutes versus their complement. Uh, but there was also somehow this, uh, this, and I think that also my na naive reading of the, of the literature is that there is some disagreement in the field of some of the types of mechanisms that could credibly be identified using lab experiments versus field experiments, whether evidence and behaviors identified in the lab um, generalizes to the to the field, and uh, there are there are a couple of papers that I'm aware of that actually do show that that for example prosocial behavior uh, shown in the lab actually doesn't manifest in the in the field. So that there is there is this potential tension. But I wanted to get a sen sense from our our speakers you know, how they think about this uh, somehow substitutability versus complementarity between these uh, between these two methods. Uh, or is it just that the, the, there is always a best method for a question? Uh, maybe I, I just say one thing. Uh, so I, I have one project where we wanted to understand culture. So culture is a really difficult one to manipulate in the field, I would say. Um, so this is uh, a project where you know, so I, I think some, some, some elements, some things are more difficult to manipulated in the field that may, for this reason, uh, a lab experiment may be uh, advantageous. Um, so I think, yeah, so the short answer, I think it depends really on the, on the question and what it is you want to uh, create variation uh, on. Um, um, yeah, uh, something else. Uh, so yeah, it depends on the question. And so yeah, and sometimes I think they can go hand in hand. So so especially what I mentioned at the end about manipulation strength, to make sure your manipulation is strong enough and that you're you're actually manipulating what you think you are. Um, for this, um, I'd say lab experiments can be uh, can be very useful. So, so then, um, that could be something that you run prior to actually going to the field. That you have. I, I'm happy yeah. to maybe oh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Vanessa. Uh, I was just gonna say that I, I completely agree that it sort of depends on what you're studying. And I think it's useful to think about um, is the phenomenon that you're interested in likely to be affected by social desirability bias? If so, the lab is probably, maybe you'll run into those types of issues. So as someone who's, who's interested in like pro-social stuff, like that's one of the, the most commonly now realized things, you know, what people say in the lab that they would actually do um, in response to or as pro-social behaviors when it really comes down to their decisions in the field or in sort of real context, it's not actually what they do. So that applies to that type of it, phenomenon. I think you can maybe ask yourself, is it likely to apply to sort of the phenomenon that I'm interested in? Um, I have never actually combined like a field experiment with a lab experiment in a paper. I have done archival data with a lab experiment to try to get a mechanism in some in some in some papers. Um, I have I'll also echo what uh, Marika was saying in terms of I have used uh, just kind of lab experiments as a way to try to um, help the design of the main field experiment. So, you know, thinking about potential reviewer concerns, particularly, so Maria was showed that, you know, in one way, in some ways to sort of in increase the salience of your manipulation, sometimes you're doing things like including a logo and manipulating the text and maybe putting an image of a person. And one potential reviewer critique you can get from that is like, well, is it, you know, is it really this, this, this proxy for what you're saying you're manipulating, or is it just the image that you happen to put on, you, you happen to vary and things like that. So I have found that you would lab experiments to sort of preempt some of those types of critiques, 
where you can say, oh, we tested, this was equal on all sorts of dimensions. And so then we use this in our main study. Um, that I think can be a really great way to combine, combine the two. Um, I think I would just underline what uh, both Marike and Vanessa say. I think it really depends um, as well. Uh, you know, I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll share my frustrations um, as an author, like sometimes I get from reviewers who don't do field experiments, like, well, we don't know what your mechanism is, like do it on Mechanical Turk. Um, and I'm like, no, it doesn't make any sense at all to do it on Mechanical Turk because the people that are in my field experiment are 40 year old entrepreneurs who have a mortgage to pay and they've basically taken out a second loan on their home and they have very different incentives. Um, and it, like a five second study with an unemployed person in Omaha is really not gonna help uh, get you know, at the mechanisms. And so this is maybe as a kind of a jumping off point maybe to kind of a broader issue is that I think you know, our, our, you know, the word mechanism has pervaded um, the management literature. And I think there's a, a, a poor understanding of what that means um, broadly. I think uh, there's a sense that it's, you know, some, some, you know, kind of psychological things, people aren't able to kind of identify it clearly. And I think, um, you know, the mechanisms vary quite a bit in terms of type. And so what our lab experiments really good for is when you believe that, you know, there is a psychological um, process uh, that is shared by all human beings in one form or another that is affected by uh, that is being affected by your experiment. Then I would say yes, the the field experiment and the lab experiment there there's a mapping. But if there's an organizational process, the mechanism is organizational. Uh, there's no way that you like it's a waste of time to do a lab experiment uh, or a, and definitely not a mechanical Turk experiment. Uh, because it doesn't map on at all. Uh, so I think, you know, if you as an author get like reviewers that say, you know, do a lab, do a lab experiment, I would push back. I think it, it, uh, it sullies the research and, uh, and makes it actually worse. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, um, so that's one, one point. Um, and that's my kind of hard, hard strands. I like to be controversial. Um, so the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, there's a parallel to the basic sciences uh, to what we do. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but, you know, you think about, you know, the discovery that uh, BPA leads to cancer um, is a kind of an example that I like. You know, initially, this finding was uh, discovered in kind of larger scale epidemiological studies of correlations in plastic, excuse me, plastic consumption and cancer rates. This is like the large scale studies that, that we had. Like, obviously there's no causality, there's no mechanism. Then people started doing this stuff in mice, with mice models. So injecting BPA, which is a pseudoestrogen into the mice. And they found that in the mice, uh, you were beginning to see the formation of cancers. Now, mice cells are not built to last 80 years, right? Uh, uh, mice bodies are different than human bodies. And so the fact that uh, BPA causes cancer in mice doesn't mean it'll cause cancer in humans. And so now you get this interesting thing, what, what are the policy implications of like this, these two sets of findings, this correlational stuff, and then this stuff in these mice models um, to human beings, should we ban plastics with BPA? And to get to that point where you can say like, um, you know, BPA changes human cells in a meaningful way that will lead to cancer. That took 20 years of people trying to grow human cells um, in a Petri dish uh, and then inject BPA and just look at the first reaction uh, of that cycle from the mouse into a human cell to be able to tell that difference. And so I, I think they all, all three approaches provide evidence, but they're complementary pieces of evidence they're not equivalent pieces of evidence. Um, and so the key challenge for a researcher is to understand where that complement comes from. What does the lab experiment give you that it doesn't give you in the field ex or a field experiment doesn't give you? And if it doesn't give anything, then it's not necessarily a, um, a valid approach. But I'll, I'll pause there.
And I'll also just, um, one thing I'll add is, so to the extent that the, the best is if you can prove mechanism in your field experiment. And this is not always possible, but it is worth thinking about in the design. If you're going to be asked to shed light on mechanism, what can you do? Are there moderators you can gather? Um, are, can you survey the participants or do some qualitative interviews afterwards? Um, ways to try to get at, you know, to Shark's point, you, you want to use your, your same sample, ideally, to sort of say something about me mechanism. And if you, the ideal is if you can actually prove mechanism within your design, that there's often limitations to doing that. But I think it is a useful process, thought process to go through even before you implement, because maybe you can't show like a mediation analysis or something, but you can show some variation with a moderator that kind of points to the mechanism that you're making the case for, et cetera. I'll add one more point. Completely agree with Vanessa, 100%. If you can show it in your, your field experiment, if you collect that data, which means that if you're, you know, with the field experiment, you're going to plan, um, you know, what data you're going to collect. And so having a good theory about how the action is happening is critical. Uh, but, you know, an experiment is also a, a, an exercise in learning. And so you may not be able to pre-specify everything you're going to learn, uh, you know, before you run the experiment. So you don't know. And, and here, here's kind of my other kind of added point, which is in most contexts, even in the sciences, you'll never know the mechanism. Um, or you can rule out mechanisms, um, but like pinpointing a mechanism, I think it is incredibly hard for one, one, two reasons. One is like some of the processes are just really, really hard to observe. And uh, the relationship between um, cause and effect may be compli complicated because uh, the reason that uh, taking say SAT classes will improve your SAT um, may be different for different people. Maybe for some people, it's because they're sitting in a room with other highly motivated people. For other people, it's because they're sitting there and taking that test over and over again. For other people, that's basically the awareness that you're, you know, need to do well on the SAT and that motivates you. And so this idea that there is a mechanism, I think, is actually like pretty pseudoscientific because most likely there are lots of mechanisms at play. And the question is, can you triangulate which ones are the more likely versus uh, the ones that are less likely. Maybe just uh, to complement, I think one issue in reality is often that the treatment itself may be a bundle, maybe a bundled up set of stuff. And so the mechanism is going to be hard if it's really, uh, so we, we were actually facing this in the study in, in, in DRC where we worked with health centers where the treatment was a, a, is really a, a bundle, a govern, we call it a governance bundle, but it's a, a bunch of stuff. And so, which still, you know, it doesn't rule out that we can, we should reflect over mechanism, um, but um, it, it won't be, uh, yeah. So what we're doing now is yeah, using uh, interview data um, to get, get us and see if we can rule out some mechanisms, maybe uh, is there some support for some, but this paper will, you know, given it's a bundle, we're not gonna be able to uh, pin down exactly um, what the, the mechanisms was. Um, so, so, but yeah, but that shouldn't stop us from understanding how bundles work because uh, I think in reality, often managers want to see something that works, and so they won't they will want to put a lot of stuff or pile a lot of stuff into the treatment uh, that seems you know uh, realistic in their setting. So I think we, we could still study it, but that obviously limits also somewhat on what we can say about the mechanism. Thank you. So we, we are out of our scheduled time, but I still wanted to give uh, if you could bear with me for a couple of minutes more, that would that would be that would be great. I wanted to open it up for um, for any questions from the audience uh, that that you may have. Mm, it would be that would be great. If not, there was also one comment about this most common uh, a plus reviewers concerns, uh, but maybe we can first see if there are some new questions from the uh, from our participant. Clearest panel ever. Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, then maybe just to close, and I apologize for going a little bit over time, but could you uh, each uh, one of you give one somehow example of a very legitimate and hard to address for your comment from, or a, a concern from a referee or an AE. So a legitimate one where you reflected and you said, I should have done it better, uh, somehow differently, 
to be able to uh, either to preempt or to easily address this concern. And if not, then I'm just, uh, if, if it never came up, that means that you just thought of everything. But uh, I was, uh, I thought it I could mean, be interesting for the audience. I'll say that a, a very common comment that comes up, I think, both with <clears throat> online um, field experiments like I've done, as well as broader like field experiments, like like in a firm like the one I, I described today is generalizability. So some reviewer is always going to comment that either you know employees at a bank in Latin America are a very particular type and not representative of a broader employee or you know finance is a specific industry and so what does it mean if we were to implement this in another type of firm? Um, and then for the online labor market type place type of, of experiments, you know, well, up workers are a different type of worker. Can we really generalize that to sort of full time employees or their boundary conditions on that, or, et cetera? Um, and I, you know, I think that it's a fair comment, but uh, and it's one that comes up, at least for me, often. And um, you kind of figure out how to sort of be careful about the boundary conditions about what you can and can't conclude and and try to convince the review team that you know despite any of those boundary conditions it's still it's still sort of an important and um, makes a contribution shall i go next so so i uh so one thing to speak to vanessa's problem is that we should get more people to replicate so please replicate <laughs> also uh experiments that have been run uh that would help us to to uh, address generalizability concerns um, I think, yeah, for sure, one thing I really regret uh, and it relates to attrition. Um, we had an, a year and a half experiment in the field in Congo, um, and we wanted to run the end line surveys of surveying the people who were exposed to the treatment after a year and a half. Um, uh, yeah, we delayed, I mean, we were forced to delay because of presidential elections and violence, but actually uh, delayed, we delayed by a couple of months, which meant that we, we, we really struggled uh, to, to, to find people who we, we who were exposed to the, to the experiment and um, I think maybe uh, we should have still continued trying harder at some point you give up but that's that's is quite uh, painful now uh, because that is like the big comment that we're getting uh, now in the review process like uh, and so of course you, there's tricks you can do to deal with attrition but um, best of all is to try to not have it uh, and think about original ways of um, yeah um, ensuring that your subjects remain interested in following up with you in the survey and so on. Um, I, I can I can maybe add some um, uh, as well from my own experience as an author, and then maybe from the perspective of um, uh, of an AE uh, as well. Um, so, as an author, I think uh, related to Vanessa's point, I think. Um, the generalizability question comes up all the time. And I think often it relates to the sample that you have. Um, and so for me, that has often come up with, so what? Um, uh, and the generalizability, not in just in terms of the sample, but in terms of the treatment, like how does this treatment actually map on to like how people experience this in the real world? Um, and, uh, so making sure that your treatment is something that can happen in the real world or could happen in the real world um, is kind of important. So I think that has come up uh, often for, for me. Um, uh, you know, if you're saying your field experiments about reality, then I think mapping that uh, is a task you have to do. Um, the, so, the so what? Uh, then I think from you know, the perspective of like um, experimental hygiene, I, I think the bar has gotten higher and higher over the years. Um, I'm just seeing just amazing experiments um, uh, uh, passing through the journals now. And I feel a little bit afraid for my own uh, career because of how good the experiments have gotten. Um, uh, uh, and a couple of things there, I think people are very uh, kind of, to, you know, Marike's point is I think you know, people are just really attuned as reviewers now to things like pre-registration, um, making your data available, um, being clear about what your protocol was, what exactly the treatment was, that transparency is critical. 
Um, and, you know, people have often asked me, like, what do you think the biggest methodological change in our field, in, in the social sciences, even more broadly over the last, you know, five years even has been? And I think it's just showing your work. Um, uh, just the sheer amount of uh, requirements in terms of like the data, your analysis, your analysis plan, um, you know, all of these things, you make, keep it documented um, uh, to Marika's, uh, Marika's point, I think is just so important. So that's one perspective from an AE. I think reviewers will demand that. I think the other thing is um, it is no longer the case that people will get, let you get away with short-term outcomes um, because, you know, those studies have been done and now the question is, what are the long-term implications of these treatments? Uh, uh, will they last? Uh, what are the one-year out, two-year out outcomes? And, and that means that the cost of doing the experiment increased dramatically, and then the logistical challenges, as, as uh, Marike uh, mentioned, and actually Vanessa showed in her uh, graph as well, is just attrition is intense, um, and that's costly to prevent it. Um, and so really having a large enough sample size that you can deal with attrition, which is bound to happen, means that um, uh, you know an important thing is plan the experiment well, have a great team and have a decent amount of money to be able to handle these uh, things because you know you can't get away with uh, non-pre-registered short-term, almost lab-like studies in the field anymore because I think the bar is just you know constantly changing. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for being part of this wonderful panel. Uh, we are going to have the second uh, SEMO panel on methods that was put together by Gwen, who is who I see on the, on the screen, and John Chen on formal models and simulations in strategy research on December 16th. Uh, so please register and, uh, and join if you're interested in this method. And again, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our great panelists for sharing their experiences. And we all hope to see more field experiments in uh, and hopefully better field experiments in in our field.